Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here to welcome all of you to our panel on the perils of punctuation. As you can see just by looking to my right, we have an all-star panel of extremely distinguished translators here today who will talk about the danger zone of punctuation and hopefully maybe the thrills of it as well. So um, just going immediately to, um, my name is Avia Kushner. And many, I see many friends in the room. It's really lovely to see all of you. And uh, immediately to my right is Susan Bernofsky. We have immediately to Susan's right, who someone even busier than, well, I, I would say b writing even more busily than I feel that I'm writing is Aron Alchi, who needs no introduction. Uh, just to his, his right is Marion Schwartz. And all the way to the right is Lisa Bradford. Uh, we're going to start with Lisa. And... Uh, Looking forward to a fantastic panel. So, good afternoon to everyone. Um, if you're here, you may be the dutiful sons and daughters of punctuation. Um, I find it uh, one of my pet peeves is people who write me, hi Lisa, instead of hi comma, Lisa, on emails. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but that's how it was brought up. So I suppose a lot of you are rather persnickety, and in my translations, I'm also persnickety. And I um, wanted to begin with a quotation from Adorno so that you would understand why I'm persnickety, because I'm also um, a lover of music. And he wrote in an essay, um, there's no element in which language resembles music, more than in punctuation marks. He said that an exclamation mark was like silent symbols clashing and question marks like musical upbeats. Um, and this is, I think, a wonderful notion regarding tonality and what we need to do when we're translating. However, I translate an Argentine poet named Juan Gelman, who is also known for his non-use of punctuation. There are no commas, there are no periods, very little capitalization. He uses um, slashes as either marks of apposition or breath beats. In fact, I've used slashes even when he doesn't use slashes to make sure that I can maintain his musicality. So for me, that slash is just part of language that I can integrate and use to ensure his musicality. But I don't really want to talk about slashes today, even though that's an important part of his, um, his poetic work. He, um, the only punctuation he uses in great abundance is the question mark. Um, and the question mark I once asked him when I was interviewing, interviewing him, um, why so many question marks? Because you see nothing else. You see the slashes and then just question marks all over. And he said, well, once when I was in Ecuador, I saw a graffiti on a wall. And it said, after I had all the answers, they changed all the questions. And this was particularly important in his work because in, um, in his watershed volume, uh, Color de Buey, which was, wait a second. I have to do this, I'm sorry because I'm excited about it. Out of there, out of there. I'm going to have an apple fall out in a minute. <laughs> um, this book was just published. This was out in the late 60s, and um, it's just been published like a few days ago, so it's my, it's my pride and joy right now. Anyway, um, this is when all the questions came up because he left the Communist Party, and he left the Communist Party, among other things, because they were asking him to write poems about you know, thematically and um, politically correct. And he wasn't happy with that. So uh, questions began um, peppering his work throughout. Um, and it's a problem for a translator, someone who translates into English in particular, because most of you know that uh, Spanish uses an inverted question mark to ensure the tonality of the reading. Um, this is particularly important in Spanish because if you say something like, are you going to the party, um, you're going to the party, it's exactly the same because word order doesn't change. It's just the emphasis, the tonality that brings us that. Vas a la fiesta, vas a la fiesta. It's exactly the same sentence, 
But when you start with an inverted question mark, we know that it's going to be a question. Um, this poses all kinds of problems for um, students of English because they'll get a long sentence and get to the end and see that there's a question mark and all of a sudden their voice will go Whoop! and you know they haven't done the question all the way through. Um, we're also doing um, in my translation workshop uh, Frank O'Hara and if you're familiar with his work um, you know he has a lot of exclamation points and um, and in Spanish he just looks hysterical because it's just you know, you've got double duty hysterical uh, exclamation points throughout. But in the case of Helman, um, for the most part, you know, we have question words, how, when, where, and that sort of thing. And we have our word order. So for the most part, I haven't felt uh, any kind of need to deal with the inverted question mark, even though it did exist in English. Some people tried to impose that too, but it was already in the 18th century that it was established in Spain. Um, and taken up completely by the 19th century, getting lost now because it's just one more thing to text. So people are texting without the inverted question mark. But Helman would never have, um, have done that. Um, so we come to, um, some of you have the example. I had no idea we would um, have so many people here. Um, but there, there, I came to a problem. His uh, very last book that was published before his death in 2013 um, was he began sending me uh, drafts of those poems already in 2011. And they were called at the time condenas, condena uno, condena dos, condena tres, uh, because they were triggered by the fact that the executors of his son who was disappeared in 1976 were finally um, judged and sentenced. And he had spent many, many years wondering what kind of closure that would give him. So it sparked this book. Um, he finally, once he came up with the 288 poems, which ponder justice and death, and one other problem which, has, which followed him throughout his, um, his writing career was, what can poetry do to incite a revolution? Can poetry incite a revolution? What is poetry good for at the end of the day? Um, all of his books have those questions. That's one of the main questions, in fact. And he also um, worked off Hamlet a lot, riffing off to be or not to be. You find this in all of his books in one way or another. So you, action, non-action, um, and that sort of thing. So this book became just Roman numeraled, finally. It wasn't called Sentences anymore. It was instead called Oi, Today. Uh, but they're all Roman numerals, 288 poems, except for the very last poem. And you have the very last poem there that begins with an inverted question mark and E. This is his last poem that he published while he was al alive. Um, well, if it had closed with a question mark, like would have been proper, um, it would have given us a very different reading, among other things, because that E would have usually been accompanied by this gesture, E, <laughs> and that's not what he's getting at at all. He's getting at, let's read this as a continuation, not only of everything I've written before, but the rest of this poem is going to be closing at the very end here. So I'm going to read it for those of you um, who don't have it. Uh, I'll read it in Spanish first, just so you can get the rhythm here. <clears throat> Y si la poesía fuera un olvido del perro que te mordió la sangre, una delicia falsa, una fuga en mí mayor, un invento de lo que nunca se podrá decir, y si fuera la negación de la calle, la bosta de un caballo, el suicidio de los ojos agudos, y si fuera lo que es un cualquier parte y nunca avisa, y si fuera... So we would end with a question. You may think that um, that can be easily translated, but when we do it in English, if there is no sign that this is a question, when we get to the when we start reading this long sentence, you know, it could continue with a conditional. It could have been, and if poetry were a forgotten memory of the dog, then whatever. Um, but you have to go down there, and you have to deal with his slashes, his appositions. Um, so I've been struggling with this. I was, we were asked 
to talk about a translation problem with punctuation, come up with a, a what was the word? A, a pretty solution or a something or another. I don't, I don't know exactly what the wording was. I, don't, I haven't published this book yet. I'm still working on it. So I don't have a solution yet, and I'd really like to dialogue about this. But um, let me just, you see on the handout that I've, I've tried and, and, I've tried and what if. The what if you know, just loses all the brevity of this, just one little mark and an E, so I, I wasn't happy with that. I thought about using the inverted question mark and having and. Um, I'm not really sure about this, but I'll read it since a lot of you don't have it here. This is how it would ha should read. Um, and if poetry were a forgotten memory of the dog that mauled your blood, a false delight, a venerable fugue in me major, an invention of what can never be said, and if it were the denial of the street, the manure of a horse, the suicide of two keen eyes, and if it were just some anywhere that never sends word, and if it were. So that's the last line that he published in his lifetime, still questioning action, still questioning justice, still questioning the place of poetry. So I'm um, very torn regarding this poem because I feel like I have to make a real statement at the end of this book. And I'll just leave it there. I have a few more things to say, but I'd rather talk about it with you when we're done with all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, next, since she's closest to me, I thought Susan Bernofsky would love to speak next. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. I hope I didn't break anybody's eardrums just now. It's hard to be coordinated. Also, I thought this was a panel about punctuality, which I got that part right. <laughs> But no, that's not true, because I knew I was, I, I'm filling in actually for, for Jeffrey Buntrock, who said, let's go talk about Adorno. So apparently we have a pact that everyone's going to talk about Adorno. But I brought, in, I brought in different quotes from the same essay. So Adorno has an essay about punctuation, which is six pages long and really, really interesting. And it's part of his book, Notes on Literature, from 1958. And he has interesting things to say about, about history and punctuation. He says... And it's all very fraught, because it's Adorno. But I'm responsible for German. Everyone on this panel is representing a different language. So we're all talking about punctuation issues in our language. So obviously German. I have to do Adorno, right? History has left its residue in punctuation marks. And it is history, far more than meaning or grammatical function, that looks out at us, rigified and trembling slightly from every mark of punctuation. So. The history of punctuation, or the historicity of punctuation, is presented as something fraught and terrifying, you know, because it's Adorno, right? Um, but he says some really interesting thing tracing the development of punctuation. For him, punctuation marks are, yes, like musical notation, as Lisa quoted. Also, he says they're like traffic signals. In fact, he says traffic signals are based on them. They punctuate your drive, right? Um, and he talks about the difference, say, between the ancient Greek semicolon, which was one raised dot, and its purpose was to keep your voice raised as you read, whereas the modern one, you know, is a dot and a comma. The dot, wait, right, the dot lowers the voice because it's like a period, but the comma keeps it raised. This is the Adorno take on the semicolon, which he says is truly a dialectical image and that reproduces the distinction between antiquity and modernity. I quote, finitude refracted through the infinite. See, semicolons are interesting. Um, semicolons are important to me because I translate from German and one of the things that happen that happens a lot when you translate from German is you have to deal with the fact that um, what in English is so cruelly called the run-on sentence is not a problem. You can put, you know, lots and lots of commas, you can string it along, you know, you, that's then you, it's called a fluid prose style. Um, and both Robert Walzer and Jenny Erpenbeck, who I translate, love very, very long sentences, which are really, 
a bunch of short sentences strung together, but if you just throw a lot of periods up in there, it changes the vibe of it because of something about this flowingness that, that is part of the text. And so that's something that you have to deal with. But besides that, I'm not, I'm not that interested in punctuation. I don't even know anything about it, but I, I made myself sit down and write down some things. So I'm gonna share with you the two things I know about grammar. Um, but I, I will say this, um, which I, I, there's a couple of my former students out here, which is, which is terrifying because, <laughs> because they've seen what I do in workshop, which is whenever a, a punctuation problem shows up, I say I don't know about grammar, about punctuation, and don't care, um, <laughs> which is not very helpful. But th th here's what the thing is: um, in my own translation practice, I consider both grammatical structures, i.e., syntax, and punctuation basically just a delivery system for information. So, you know, whatever complicated, you know, set of relative clauses, you know, if you're translating from German, lots and lots of clauses, all these structures that you have, these grammatical structures, I think they exist merely as this prop to put the elements of the sentence, the actual images, the words, in the right order and hold them in that order so they hit the reader's ear in the right order. And punctuation also helps with this ordering and also it, it helps organize the information so that you, you get little clusters of things that belong together and don't mix them up with the other clusters. So I think of it really just as a delivery system. So it's certainly something that, in my view, doesn't have to be translated one on, one to one. I have no problem with changing up punctuation totally. Um, but I think the order in which an author presents au uh, information is a key element in that author's style and the nature of the work. Okay, so here are some here are some German um, German things to think about. So run-on sentences. I've said that already. Yes, what counts as run-on in English is in German merely a particularly elegant sentence. Um, in a sense, the commas are the commas in German. You know that string together all those independent clauses. They're basically being used like semicolons in English, except if you have that many semicolons in English, it really sticks out and looks a little formal, and you know we, we bristle a little at the semicolon. It's not that popular. Um, let me quote Donald Barthelme on the semicolon. Some of you may know this. Donald Barthelme says, semicolon, a semicolon is ugly, as ugly as a tick on a dog's belly. I pinch them out of my prose. Adorno, on the other hand, loves semicolons, and he sees their demise as part of the decline of the, you know, the decline of civilization. And he says they're being squeezed out for the sake of commercialism because a, a semi, the semicolon for Adorno is not compatible with the commercialization of culture. People see semicolons and they think it's intellectual. And we know what he thought about that. Okay, commas. This almost doesn't even, isn't worth talking about, but German contains, as anyone who's ever tried to read it knows, at least three times as many commas as English because everything is its own separate little phrase or clause, and every little separate phrase or clause has commas setting, setting it apart. You know, commas from German to English are usually best translated by eliminating them. Like exclamation points, which a German also way overuses, way more, I don't know, is it, we could have the contest between question marks in Spanish and <laughs> exclamation points in German. So every sort of first person imperative, every imperative in fact, like, you know, pick that up. It's not pick that up, it's pick that up. And like, um, <laughs> Let's take notes. It's not let's take notes. It's let's take notes. You know, it's it's all very perky. the the whole the whole the whole German language is just full of them. But the Germans are getting embarrassed about them and using fewer. It used to even be that your 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 letter would begin, "Dear Mom!" exclamation point. But this is falling into disfavor in the German-speaking world. To my great pleasure. But Robert Walzer uses them all the time. In fact, I just translated. I'm, for the, I'm writing a biography of him, and the, I'm translating the first poem he ever wrote at age 19, and it's called Future! Exclamation point. <laughs> the title has an exclamation point. Um, you think Adorno likes exclamation points? He's a fun-loving guy, right? He says, the exclamation, the exclamation point in German has become intolerable <laughs> after its overuse by the German expressionists. Seen in German expressionists' texts today, they look like the multiple zeros on the banknotes printed during the German inflation. <laughs>
All right. On my list of German punctuation is the word den. The word den, D-E-N-N. -N. This is a word that might as well be punctuation. It translates technically as for in the, in the, in the sense of for that is like because, as in he must have been very weary indeed for he fell asleep straight away. And this four has, you know, it's not, we don't like it in American English anymore. It sounds affected or faux old or we're trying to sound British or something. Um, and in German, this is one of the most commonly used conjunctions um, because everything in German is very logical. On the other hand, you can't translate it really as because, because because is a stronger causal connection than this den or the English for, for since, you know, there, there, there's a continuum, like for is not as, is the weakest causal connection, since is a little stronger, because is the strongest. I mean, I'm not a grammarian, I'm just saying that's how I think it is, that may, it may not be true. Um, but there's a sense in which if you translate this, a word like this, you're adding logic to a sentence that in, in the original didn't have so much logic in it. And that's kind, of, that's kind of interesting. So I often translate the word den, meaning for, as a colon, or I leave it out. Because it's really just a way of saying that these two sentences, you know, he, he must have been weary indeed. He fell asleep right away. Do you need a word telling you because? Maybe. What if you put a semicolon in there? So I think that this, this notion that we have that punctuation and words are definitely different things maybe isn't always true. I don't know. Um, all right, I'm going to end with the dash. Um, I am convinced that the dash is the translator's best friend because it's capable of fulfilling several different functions. So it can substitute for those nasty little commas in the run-on sentence. If you're sick of semicolons, you can put some dashes in there. Um, it can fill in for a colon if you're overusing them. It can translate the word den or for. Um, so it fill in for a semicolon, fill in for a colon. Adorno likes the dashes. He says, literary dilettantes can be recognized by their desire to connect everything. And that's very smart, you know, forcing the appearance of logic where there is none. So a dash links things without the pretense of connection. And in German, the, the little words that set things up in logical relation to one in another come as naturally as breathing. And if you translate them into English, you're creating a greater sense of pointing out connections and pointing out logic than was there in the original. So that's all I have to say. It's not so much, but... Um, Fortunately, there are other people talking. Thanks. I see. Okay. <clears throat> oh, no. Yeah. Go for it. No, 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 go, go. Oh, you want me to? I'll show it. Well, I do. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I am honored to introduce Aron Aji, who is a very distinguished translator from the Turkish. And let me just take a commercial break and make sure that everyone in the audience knows the languages that we're talking about. Aron is speaking from Turkish. Coming up will be Marian from Russian. And I'll speak a little bit about Hebrew. I want to commend everyone for really concentrating on the nitty gritty of punctuation. It's not that easy to comprehend, especially when you don't speak the language. So I, w I want to recognize that. And I also thought I would, before our own starts, I'll just take a commercial break to say that when I first saw the title of this panel, I thought it was really fascinating, and I thought when Susan just said something very interesting about how punctuation and words, you know, she's not convinced that they're the same, you know, maybe, what's the relationship? Are we talking about punctuation? Are we talking about words? And I just finished a book about the experience of reading the Bible in English after a whole life of reading it in Hebrew, and I can tell you one of the first things that I noticed, one of the first things that really shocked me was that the Bible in translation has punctuation. The Hebrew does not. And so I really started to think about how punctuation is really about meaning. And so I encourage you, even if you don't understand, even if you've never seen an inverted question mark or whatever, the particular punctuation mark that we're discussing, to think about how punctuation and meaning intersect. And after we all present, we'll have some questions about that. Thank you. Well, pretty much you gave my talk. I'll give your talk. No, no. <laughs> you did, you did. Oh, no. <laughs> um, no, no, yeah. Of course, next time we're going to have an entirely new panel on emojis. 
Wouldn't it be nice? I was just thinking about it. Um, no, it's a beautiful segue. Um, you know, a student of mine said, why can't we have one translation theory that just applies to everything? I said, because every translation act is an encounter of two incommensurable languages. And to come up with a theory that applies to every different pairing is, is really nearly impossible. But I think um, punctuation especially sort of resides in that gray area between those two languages because, um, you know, um, the author that I often translate uh, says that a literary, a great literary text simultaneously is engendered and engenders the language that makes it possible. So, no, no, no. <laughs> so, a literary text simultaneously is engendered and engenders the language that makes it possible. So, in a way, there is a generative relationship between a text and it's the process of creation, and in fact, it generates its own language. So, that is what happens in the act of creation, right? In the act of the original production. So, when that text is entering another language, we often makes the mis make the mistake of thinking of the receiving language as a very stable entity, whereas really the same kind of um, intrusive, regenerative relationship has to be established when we are moving into the next language. So what that means is playing fast and loose with English punctuation, which is very f relatively stable compared to Turkish. As Avi was saying, Turkish is itself an invented language, modern Turkish. Um, it has a 90-some year history, uh, before which it was written in Arabic script and um, did not have a, uh, a developed punctuation system. And even today, if you were to purchase two or three different newspapers in Turkey, you would find that the punctuation system is still quite unstable. Um, and so to move that, and to also try to sort of think about the punctuation in terms of meanings in Turkish, itself becomes a difficult task because they don't have direct correspondences. So um, that's one of the issues that Anytime I'm translating from Turkish to English, I have to pay attention to. And um, another one is the fact that when a text tra uh, travels from Turkish to English, it gets longer by 20%. There is an enlargement effect that happens um, because of uh, the, the structure of Turkish language. Um, it's an inflected language, and um, and so you can, in fact, create a, a paragraph worth of a sentence in one word sometimes by stringing together these um, suffixes. So Turkish, Turkish also has a vowel harmony. So certain, I mean, almost always a word will have the same kind of vowels. So it is very easy to create sound in Turkish a sound structure, sound texture in Turkish. And so to move that into English where we really are thinking about sounds as, uh, uh, you know, um, an amalgamation of words rather than an amalgamation of syllables and more complicatedly an amalgamation of syllables, words, and punctuation marks that whole thing has to be somehow deconstructed and reconceived, not just reconstructed, but reconceived, I think. And, um, uh, you know, and that's really part of the incommensurability, if you will. So um, the other thing that needs to be paid attention to is that in Turkish, meaning is also forever deferred until the very end of a sentence. And a sentence can be very long because the verb does not come until the very end in Turkish. So all of these really go hand in hand with how a Turkish reader approaches or comprehends 
punctuation marks versus how an American reader comprehends them when he or she sees them on page. So what I have uh, tried to do is actually use punctuation marks as if they are also sound units, as you were also saying. They, are, they, they, are, they participate both in the um, phonetic but also the semantic uh, content of the work. Um, especially in the work that I translate, Bilge uh, Karasu, who is a hyper-objectivist writer trying to, in fact, approximate the duration of an experience in the duration of narrative. So his use of punctuation and all the other um, properties of the Turkish language that I mentioned really become part and parcel of understanding what he is describing. So um, to do all this, to, 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 to offer you um, a chance to make sense of all of these disparate notes, I want to read to you two passages from, from this book. The, uh, it's, it's a book that um, describes three individuals taking three walks. The first individual, let's say, takes a walk that is half the length of the second individual, and the third individual takes a walk a third of the length of the first individual. This is like a GRE question. <laughs> and they all wear the same color socks, no. <laughs> now, the same parity exists in the length of the narratives. So the first section is almost half the size of the second section, and the third section is a third of the size of the length of the first section. So there is this incredible attention to every sentence somehow corresponding to some kind of a physical experience out there, outside itself. So I'm going to give you two paragraphs, and I will read Turkish and then English. Is that? She loves it. All right. Tweet that. <laughs> All right. We're being tweeted, by the way. Uh, yeah, there is Rachel. It's pretty frightening, but that's okay. Okay, so this first one is the beginning of the novel, and we have the character approaching an island after a night-long rowing of a boat. And he is nearly exhausted and the island finally becomes visible as the day is breaking. So listen to the movement. Başını çevirdiğinde karşısındaki karanlık artmaya başlıyor. Andronikos neden sonra anlıyor karanlığın niye arttığını? Adaya çok yaklaşmıştır artık. Kayalık tepenin karanlık kütlesi arasında gökyüzü belli belirsiz aydınlanıyor. Yorgun kolları artık düşüncesiz, istemsiz. Katılaşmışlığın duyusuz kolaylığı içinde kürekleri kaldırıp indirmeye devam ediyor. Kulakları işitmiyor artık. Kürekler suya girip çıkıyor. Sular sabahın dinginliği içinde sandalın iki yanında yırtılıyor, yamanıyor. I know that there are a couple of you who understand Turkish, but I think you all understand the movement of an exhausted person rowing a small sail a boat. Here is the English. He turns to look ahead. He must be getting close to the island since the dark imposing mass of its rocky peak has grown more distinct in the advancing dawn. His exhausted arms pull the oars with the numbed ease of a body that has grown indifferent to thought or will. He can hardly hear sounds. The oars plunge into the water, withdraw, plunge again. The sea tears open yielding to the boat, mends itself in the morning calm. <laughs> 
to do this, I sort of try to imagine what must be physically happening? What am I seeing here and what am I hearing here? So I use the punctuation in order to sort of emulate what I imagine to be the rowing of a very exhausted man who is increasingly insensate. Okay. Hmm? And the other one, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, Another challenge in Turkish, and that is the, I, the, the, infinite lang I, the infinite sentence is very famous in Turkish. Uh, so here is one. This is uh, in the second section and sort of ran um, you know, ranges between philosophical but also very physical in description. And um, it actually is reflecting or representing the mental workings of the narrator. And it's one sentence. Güneşin doğduğu yer nasıl bilinmiyorsa, güneşin battığı yer nasıl bilinmiyorsa, buna karşılık bir güneşin dağların ardından çıkışı ile dağların ardına düşüşü arasındaki yolu az çok biliniyorsa, Hele tepenizde durduğu zaman bu güneş nasıl bir dünyada bilinen birkaç, iyi bilinen birkaç şeyden biri ise, o yürüyüşün de başlangıç noktası ile bitim noktası sisli bir takım yeşilliklerin buğulu unutulmuşluğu içinde eriyor ama ortasına yaklaştıkça o yürüyüşün en parlak anı, öğle vakti, doruk noktası olan tepeye yaklaştıkça anılar aydınlanıyor Tepenin doruğunda hiç erimeyecek bir buz parçasının keskin aydınlığı içinde o yürüyüş, deniz kollarının birleştiği noktada bütün ömür anılara meydan okuyan bir ölümsüzlüğe kavuşuyor. <gülüyor> Period. So, now, this is really a painting a mindscape with words and punctuation. Uh, and I try to sort of move it to English. And now you will understand what he's saying. But also imagine the mental workings that I'm trying to also represent here. Just as no one knows exactly where the sun rises or where it sets, conversely, just as everyone knows with reasonable certainty the path the sun follows during the day, just as this sun hanging above you at the noon hour is among the few things you know with absolute certainty in this world, so do the farthest reaches of the walk vanish into the misty forgottenness of a certain fog-covered meadow, while near the midpoint, the summit, the noon hour, the brightest moment of the walk, memories gradually come into light, then once at the summit, the walker caught in the acute brilliance of a piece of ice that refuses to thaw, beholding the point where the arms of the sea converge, the walk attains a kind of eternity that defies all other memories. So this is, th this is a sentence that is very trying for an, um, you know, any Anglo reader because it's all about deferral. But and in Turkish, this deferral is not as bothersome because it's by, uh, Turkish is uh, understood m very intuitively. We, although the verb is at the end, we, we, we sort of have a sense of what we're getting to. But in English, this, is, this cannot be ap approximated in the same way. So as a result, I have to, in fact, use clauses to keep you interested by giving you bits and pieces of experience and, 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 and information until the very last clause that is like a standard sentence that you understand and recognize. Okay? So that's, that's it. That was wonderful. Aaron, your comments on how um, rhythm, how you can understand some of the meaning just from the rhythm reminded me of a beautiful comment from my teacher, the great poet Derek Walcott, who insisted that you could understand a good poem in any language. And as part of his attempt to convince us of that, 
he brought in a Hungarian, a poem in Hungarian by Radnoti, and was like, okay, you know, what does this mean? And everyone could tell that it was a baby rocking in someone's arms without an ounce of Hungarian. So I was thinking about that when you read your beautiful sentences from Turkish and your solutions to that. And uh, next up, we have Marion Schwartz. Marion may not realize this, but I've been especially looking forward to her talk because I've been teaching the essays of Marina Tsvetaeva, and I've received a lot of questions from students about sentence structure in Russian and punctuation, and I can't answer any of them, and all I can say is I may have an answer for you when I return from Alta. So, here's Marion. Oh, yeah, I thought this, I thought this was gonna be hard enough, and now you've added another burden to me. Um, well, I'm not gonna quote Adorno, everyone knows that. Um, I'm going to talk sort of in a different vein, um, more in my general practical, hands-on kind of way, and ways that may be helpful to those to everyone here, um, without any particularly lovely examples, unfortunately. Um, I've translated a lot, just the number of the millions of words I've translated. And I've translated all kinds of genres. And one thing that I think it's useful for translators, I think that's a, a useful thing for all translators to do, because it takes you away from the attitude about whatever language you're translating is that, oh my God, this is weird and amazing and lovely and wonderful, and I wanna tell everyone how amazing and weird it is. When in fact, some of it's amazing and some of it's standard, right? And if you translate everything in your from your whatever language you're translating from, and everything that's different from how English does it as being amazing and, and weird, then you're gonna have a bad translation because you're not gonna have any, um, any way to distinguish between what's, what the, what's standard language and what's special. And you're not gonna get the character of the writer unless you can actually tell those two things apart, those very two basic things apart. Now, I think my strong feeling is that punctuation, for all its similarities between, you know, there are similarities in usage and in and intent of punctuation, I think every language uses punctuation differently. And first of all, the notion of copying punctuation is just, it's an un unexamined view. If, if no one who's ever thought about it would ever actually, for any length of time, would do that, I hope. Um, so what, uh, there's a handout here, it's, well, I only had 20, and I've got one of them. Um, and we, I won't necessarily get to those examples. I think of, tra I think of punctuation as almost a kind of um, element of grammar, and that Trans and that assuming punctuation is going to work the same way in one language and another is uh, kind of like a false grammatical cognate, which is a really bad, there's so many things wrong with that term, but you know what I mean. Um, I was thinking, of, for example, um, the dash, when, when uh, as Susan was saying about using the dash to break up all the endless commas, well, in, uh, translating from a highly inflected language, you're gonna end up using a lot more dashes, M dashes in English, because you're, that's the only way you're gonna keep your antecedents straight for a long sentence, right? Um, so that's something an inflected language like Russian doesn't have to worry about. It doesn't use an M dash to keep an antecedent straight. So the, the punctuation mark I chose, um, I've actually talked about this punctuation, my punctuation of the week is the colon. I actually gave a talk on this, oh, maybe 15 years ago, and there was a Russian translator in the back, and it was for graduate students, and I said, none of you experienced translators can actually participate, you can listen, but don't talk. And finally, at the end, he was just bursting, because I was talking about how how really little we use the colon, particularly in comparison with, uh, with Russian. And he said, but what about George Bernard Shaw? And I thought, okay, well, anyways. Um, 
So, the colon appears a lot in Russian. It's, it's, it's used for many things that we, it's used for many of the same things we'd use it for. Mostly in English, a colon is used to say, to present um, a list. You know, you're saying, and this is whatever is following, or such as, and colon, a colon and a list. Um, but Russian uses the colon for many other things. And one of the things, it, you, some of the things are pretty obvious. Sometimes it, it's because it's used to introduce direct speech. Well, we don't do that. Um, we use a comma. So you, you've eliminated a lot of colons already in your, in your uh, translation. But it does things, it, it also has semantic meaning, as such as uh, Susan was talking about with den. It's used for, um, to introduce uh, the meaning because. And I've got an example here on that. Um, and I've got really simple examples. Uh, the teacher, учителя были счастливы, почти все свободное время, все свободное время дети, дети проводили по школьным, на школьном дворе. I can't hardly see. Um, I should have printed this bigger. Uh, the teachers were happy. So the way it works in Russian is the teachers were happy, colon. The children spent nearly all their free time in the schoolyard. Now, you can do that sometimes in English. I mean, you would understand that in English. But you can't do it every time. Then it just becomes a tick. It becomes something unusual and something special. So maybe, yes, you will find reasons to use that for in a because situation. But most of the time, it's not going to be, it's going to be because in English. The, the other way to check this is to go the other direction. For example, in this because situation, we say because a lot more than Russians say потомушта. You don't see потомушта, which means because, very often in Russian. You see a colon, generally, instead. So you get the frequency of usage for something, and you see and that, that's a, that helps you make your choice. Another um, thing that you can do, that a colon does, um, is, I don't want to do that one, and this is perhaps the most interesting one, is that it can introduce a subordinate clause. Russian often will avoid using um, that or which, and instead of introducing what we would consider that or which, uh, introducing with that or which, they'll introduce it with a colon. And of course, this obviously turns up a lot. So if you have a whole, if you, if you don't use a, that and which for relative clauses in English, you're going to have a very odd sounding language. Um, I think I'll, I'll probably leave it at that for, um, for examples of this, because I think we want time for questions, yeah? Um, there, there, are other, there are other issues um, of tone. For example, Russian uses ellipses ridiculously, um, to our mind. Of course, Russian also says alas. And, you know, I've never, I've never been able to use alas. I always think, I can just get one alas in the book, but, and then I never, it never lasts. Um, but we have a very limited use, in, use of ellipsis. We use it to mean something's left out. Occasionally to mean, occasionally it means a drifting off. But Russians are always drifting off. They are constantly drifting off because there's some higher meaning somewhere, I don't know where, um, only a Russian can tell you. Um, so you're, you're, the point is you're doing your author a disservice if you don't highlight what's wonderful about them. Presumably you're translating an author that you think is wonderful. So find out what's wonderful and not what's normal and, and use what, what tools English has to make that clear on what they're doing.
Thank you so much, Marianne. And I have to say that finding out what's wonderful and not what's normal seems like great general advice for life, right? I just stick with it that way. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief window into what happens with the Bible in translation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first two lines of the two verses of the Bible in Hebrew, and then I'll just read two translations, and I'm going to do it in a way I've never done before. I'm going to read it with the punctuation, okay? And remember that in Hebrew there isn't some at all. And then we're going to go to questions from our panel so we can have a discussion about how things go across in different languages. Okay, so here's what the Genesis 1, 1 to 2 sounds like in Hebrew. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz. Va-aretz ha-yta tov avo ve-choshech al pnei tehom. Ve-ruach Elohim berachefet al pnei ha-mayim. Okay? Here is the King James from 1611. I'm going to read it with the punctuation. In the beginning, God created the heaven, comma, and the earth, period. And the earth was without form, comma, and void, comma, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, colon, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, period. Okay? Now let's fast forward a couple hundred years. The Jewish Publication Society, translating much closer to the Jewish understanding, punctuation-wise. When God began to create heaven and earth, dash, the earth being unformed and void, comma, with darkness over the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water, dash. Okay? So it gives you a sense of how surprising punctuation can be in the Bible, and I think also how punctuation and meaning intersect. Okay? So my first question for everyone is just to borrow a little bit from Edith Grossman's Why Translation Matters, which is a fabulous book if you haven't read it. I was hoping that we could have, hear from our panelists, maybe you could articulate for us, why does punctuation matter? Who can I hand to? It matters because it, it's, it conveys meaning. And if it's not just decoration, it's meaningful. And any, any element of the text that conveys meaning is Im important, it matters. I just leaned over to Susan and I said that in the King James Version, it feels as though one of the earliest things God created were the punctuation marks. <laughs> Did you notice how many of them were just piled? And, and the, 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 Jew, the Jews, of course, were always very uh, dashing, right? Dash, dash, that's it. Um, you know, one thing that uh, I, I want to sort of problematize a little bit, <coughs> and that is, if we are really talking about bringing all these different languages into English, all these texts into English, I'd like to also see us force English out of its comfort zones every now and then. I agree with you 100% that, that you cannot put colon as many times as it appears in the original, and you, you mention every now and then. But you could do this in a way that does draw some attention to itself, so as to almost give the reader a chance to reflect on whether Colin could function differently from what is expected in English. I think it was fascinating the example you gave there and how it was read. And what occurred to me is that you know we read the King James version in prose, and I think those commas were really you know the idea of breathe, you know, recite this properly, give it time, and that's what I see in poetry. Oftentimes, I agree that there's meaning there, but also since I do poetry, there's a musicality there, and you have to give it time. And I want to know now if translators into Russian add colons. They must, right? Translating from English? Very interesting. You know, I wonder if um, there was a moment when you began to realize just how important making punctuation decisions is for a translation. Was there a particular moment in your translating practice where you thought, oh gosh, or was it? were you always aware of it just... Um, Naturally. 
I know that I first started out translating all the punctuation from all the German text I translated, and I felt that not to do so would be a betrayal of the text and you know unfaithful translation. I translated like that for quite some time, and I think every editor who saw my work would look at it and go crazy because you know it, it wasn't interesting in English. It was sticking out. It was translating the normal as if it were wonderful, and it wasn't wonderful. Um, so I think I, I think at some point I began to b believe my editors. I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> I realized that when I reviewed uh, translation into Spanish, <clears throat> and it was Jeanette Winterson's *The Passion*, and it's a very lyrical novel, and she breaks up sentences constantly for that reason to make it lyrical. And the Spanish translator had as we tell our students, you know, don't leave those choppy sentences, put them together. And she was put together constantly <laughs> so you couldn't read it as poetry. Wow. Wow. I just wanted to say I, I agree very much with Lisa about the um, punctuation being used as, as a rhythmic cue. Um, one of the things that Russian does that's also, again, a normal thing is that they do what we call a comma splice. And you can do comma splices occasionally in English for those reasons. If there's a rhythmic reason, um, and in Anna Karenina, there's a bunch of that where you have these this kind of mounting um, accumulation of of independent clauses separated by commas, and it's definitely rhythmic. But if you have if you never put an and between the the, cl the clauses, then you're you're falsifying the original, um, original text. Um, I think uh, it was uh, during translating this particular work that I became uh, much more acutely aware of uh, the, the, the importance of punctuation. I was in Ankara, and I had finished a draft of this work, and I was in Ankara giving a talk about Bilge Karasu. And, uh, 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 physics professor approached me who turned out to be an avid reader of Karasu and he said so what are you going to what are you doing with the conjunction and because this author never used ve in Turkish so I just said oh I said you can't do that in English and I I just let them in and he looked at me like very disapprovingly <laughs> And I come home feeling extremely guilty that I sort of did what most novice translators do, which is come to the defense of a mistake by making it seem like deliberate that I apparently thought about it. I hadn't. So I removed 545 ands. But now you can't just pull them out. So you have to, you have to sort of because you know they were also part and parcel of the s phonetic structures I had created, right? And you can't just make you know create all those comma splices. But by the same token, what also it made me realize is that "and" is one of the most carelessly used conjunctions in English. It stands for myriad relations, and so removing that just somehow revived my punctuation marks and uh, my approach to syntax altogether. Well, and I just want to say that and is, if you're into the Bible, is such a good thing to obsess over because in Hebrew, and isn't a word but a letter. So needless to say, just adding all the ands in the Bible, you said you removed 545 ands, just any and in the Bible is an addition. And just think about what that does to the rhythm, to the feeling, everything else, it's just a very different thing. I want to leave time for some audience questions. Are there any questions from the audience? I'm happy to hand the mic. I know the ac acoustics in this room are challenging. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to hand you the mic. OK, please. Uh, I want to know what you all think about experimental use of punctuation in one language to ex experimental use of punctuation into English. Oh, Susan. <laughs> Have a field day. I mean, if the, uh, the, I think everything that we were talking about really applied above all to authors who are using a kind of normative approach to punctuation within the languages they're writing. But the moment an author is playing with that, of course play with it in English. <laughs> 
Yes, you have permission. Do it. I, I, does that, if anyone here translates Arabic, I learned recently that Arabic is itself very conservative, but they are, they have no rules for punctuation, and so you'll get like three commas and an exclamation point, or a dash, and and just and I and I was it was a class I was teaching, and I said, well, what do you do about that? How do you know what it means? And she said. You know, it's it's just intuitive, and so they do that all the time. It's their one outlet, punctuation as their outlet, which was really wonderful for me to hear. Um, I want to say something because uh, every experiment is, is not just a divergence from the norm, but it's a reasoned divergence from the norm. It is iconoclastic, but for a purpose. So I think you have to first identify the purpose that is being served in the original and then approximate serving that same purpose in the English. Any other questions? Terrific. I was just going to answer your thing about the Arabic because it's not quite like that. Not quite. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's not quite as uh, I felt like I should jump in. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, because Arabic, uh, I guess similar to the Hebrew that, um, that you're talking about with the ands has usually used words instead of punctuation, right? So that's kind of the tradition is that you have words as punctuation. And punctuation has come in much more recently. So, yeah. So it's not really that there's a kind of um, eccentric tradition. Mm -hmm. It's that there's a very uh, recent eccentricity in punctuation. So if you know, I mean, it's not like inherent in the language. I mean, William can probably speak to it more. <laughs> but wow. That's the basics, yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Thank you for adding that to our discussion. Any other questions, anyone? While I'm back here, maybe? No? You have a question? Oh, no, OK. I wonder if our panelists have, I think we have time maybe for a question from each other. If, you, if there's something you want to ask someone else, now is your moment. Do you, you want to ask any of the other panelists a question? Now is your moment. I like to think of both. Really? Feel free. The mic goes to you. How many of you would think that using the inverted question mark in the English translation would be positive? Thank you. No, I mean, I mean in the poem that I'm citing. Especially because it's Spanish, and so, so many of us understand it. Well, that's a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Anyone else want to share their punctuation moment? You have a couple of seconds left if you, if you want to want to do that. Is that correct? I think so. Three ten. Oh, we have five minutes. Okay, so if we have a little, oh, question. A story. So I was teaching a seminar on Kafka. Um, with students both in reading in English and in German, and um, they were put off by the amount of work that I was assigning, and they had told me that I also had to write a paper, and they assigned me the topic of the semicolon in Kafka, <laughs> which I then produced accordingly, but I, I actually sent it somewhere and got no response. So I might have to, <laughs> now I'm gonna revisit this and see, so I'll send it to you, Susan. <laughs> that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Um, you know, just seeing Scott reminds me that as someone who's, who reviews a lot of translations, I would say that this is something that does help a reviewer. If you're going to do something exciting uh, punctuation-wise that isn't familiar to an English reader, uh, I've actually found that the translator's notes where the translator discusses that are really helpful and help me understand what's going on so that I can tell the difference between a mistake and something intentional, uh, something that's, that's going on. So really, 
I think that's something to, th to think about too, is to be able to articulate what's happening. I also wanted to say that I think Aron's comments reminded me of Benjamin, you know? The idea of expanding the language that you're translating into is a good thing, it's a good thing. Um, last call, I see a hand. So um, I'd like to ask the panel about their experience in uh, translating poetry. So for example, back to the Arabic case, um, in poetry, it's known that it's the, in Arabic poetry at least, it's known that poets have a lot of freedom in, in placing their uh, commas and uh, punctuation uh, wherever that you want. And I wonder what would your approach be to translating poetry with punctuation specifically. Would you be more conservative? What would you do? Okay, let me block this mic back. Well, I think, Lisa, this has to be you. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I, I have done that type of poetry, too. And if I can find a system, if I can find a comma that means something, and I realize what it means, then I would try to create an, ana an analogous situation, frankly. Um, if there's more punctuation than needs be, and I'm seeing that that's because, you know, somebody's asthmatic, you know, I would, I would try to do that in, in the English version, I think. Whereas, in my case, Hellman does not use it. The only thing he uses is the question mark and the slash then I try to create an analogy, if it works in English. W whatever works in English, but you have to understand what the poet's doing, if there really is a system there, and try to create, it again, an analogy in the punctuation. That's what I do. And if I may just add, because you mentioned consistency, and that's really critical. Um, you know, you have to give your reader time to l understand why what is being, what's happening on the text is happening. And then they will, in fact, uh, play along. About this and business, it, I have a very funny uh, anecdote. The editor said to me, wow, said, this is really a tour de force. They still read beautifully your sentences, except in two instances, can we put them back in? I said, no, I mean, because you can't put them in even once. So it says, again, you have to sort of create your own system, if you will, punctuation system. I want to just emphasize something that both Aran and Lisa said, but to kind of say it again, to put it out there. And, and I think that we, and the thing is this, I think that we as translators often have the default setting when we're looking at something that another language does that English usually doesn't do to say, okay, well, English doesn't do that, so I'm not going to do it. Um, and I think it's important to be reminded that we should always ask the question, is the author using it emphatically? You know, is it an important part of the work? Because sometimes, you know, we can make English do all kinds of stuff if it's appropriate. I think that's a wonderful point. And just to answer, I'll just maybe end with the Bible since it's the most translated text that we have. And I'll answer you for, in terms of translating poetry, I, f I think that one of the most amazing things about the Psalms in translation is how many declarative statements become questions in translations of the Psalms. And I think that, so I'm not sure if it's the brevity of the Psalms that makes that stand out more, but I can certainly empathize with your question, and it's something that I've thought about a lot, and I wish all of us many hours of punctuation happiness in the future. Oh,